All right, so today we are in this series called Travel Light. If you've missed any of them along the way, get online, our, our website at edgewaterchurch.com, Facebook page, YouTube channel, and catch up on those because it's been a really good series as we've walked through letting go some of these things that we hold on to, some of these things that weigh us down, some of these things in this world that, that hold us back spiritually. And so today what I want to do is I want to, we, Kaylee just read from Luke chapter 2, we're going to take a step back and we're going to look at Luke chapter 1 and we're going to let that speak to us today about letting go of control. All right, so, um, so I'm curious, how many of you would honestly say in, in at least one area in your life that you have something that you like to control? And I think every hand in this place should be up, every hand online should be up as well. Um, if you find yourself tempted to reach over and lift the hand of the person sitting next to you, just understand that God is going to speak to you today about uh, letting go of control. So this is from Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26, a story that's very familiar to us this time of year. In the sixth months of, month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Now, some of you right now, today, those of you who are here, those of you who are watching online, you may be confused about something that's going on in your life. I, I wish this wasn't happening. Why, why am I here? I never thought I would experience this. You're, you're disturbed. You're saying, I, I, I can't handle this. I don't know what we're going to do. I'd like to take control. I need to figure this out. Why in the world are we going through this? I never thought at this point in my life I'd be experiencing what I'm experiencing. Mary was confused and disturbed. It rolls on in, in verse 30 where it says, Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And then down in verse 34, it says, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. And Mary responded, this is not very convenient for me. It, it, it's not in my five-year plan. You, you have no idea if this happens that I'm going to be pregnant in my wedding gown. And, and, you know, we paid good money for all these pictures. I want to look good in my wedding pictures. Nope, this is what she said, verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Disturbed, confused, the angel speaks. And she says, Let it be. Let it be. Now, I'm... I'm not a mind reader up here, but I can tell that there's some of you that are thinking, this is the perfect message for my spouse to hear. <laughs> this one's for my mother-in-law. I'm going to make sure that I forward this one on Facebook. I am so glad that they're going to hear this one. And you're going to think, I'm not controlling. I'm just aggressively helpful. <laughs> I'm not controlling. I'm just thoroughly organized. Listen, some of you, you are wound so tight you make coffee nervous. All right? <laughs> You, you, know, you know how it is. You want to control everything. Your kids know it. You want to control what they look like, where they go, who they hang out with, what they do, what they make on the SAT, where they go to college, who they're going to marry, how many grandkids they're going to have, and how they're going to take care of you when you're old. You want to control them. Your spouse, you're wearing them out. How you chew, how you dress, what you say, what you want, where you go, how you load the dishwasher, how you reload the, reload the toilet paper. And of course, it has to be with it over the top. You know, it, if you don't do it over the top, you did not honor God um, because we do, as a, we do everything as unto the Lord, right? And uh, so, but, but you want to be in control. Some of you, you really want to control what people think about you. And social media is your greatest weapon then. You get to show everybody the life that you want them to see. You know, filtered, edited. It took you 37 attempts to get the perfect picture at the Christmas tree. You almost gave away one child and got divorced, but hashtag blessed. Right? It, it's funny because the more you try, some of y'all, you did that. I can tell. It's funny because the more you try to be in control, the more you fear losing control. And the more you fear losing control, the more you want to be in control. And that's why today, what I want to do, I'm just going to, we're going to have one, 
one main thought today. It's really simple. It's simple to, to think about, but it's not necessarily simple to do. Because to live this out, it takes faith. But I tell you what, on the other side of your faith, let me promise you, you will always see the faithfulness of God. You take this step, you will see the faithfulness of God. And so the big thought is this. So you don't always have the power to control, but you do always have the power to surrender. You don't always have the power to control, but you do always have the power to surrender. You don't always have the power to control, to make him do what you want, to make her behave like you want, to get your marriage where you want it to be, to get your finances in line, to get your future lined up, to get your health where you want it, to have your kids doing what it is you want them to do. You don't always have the power to control, but you do have the power to surrender. And when we look at a story from Luke like this, the, the angel appears to the Virgin Mary. Sometimes we look at that and we go, well, of course, it was easy for her to do. I mean, come on, she's Mary. She's got like statues made of her. She's got universities named after her. Come on, she's a, she's a big deal. But you got to understand when the angel came, she was just a regular, ordinary teenage girl. Some scholars would say she was 13, 14, 15 years old. She had hopes and dreams like any other little girl. She, she was dreaming about getting married. She didn't have like all the options that, that you do today. She couldn't, like, she couldn't Snapchat the cute guy at school or, or there was no Match.com. She couldn't get on Christian Mingle or, what, or whatever it's called. She's got a limited community to choose from. And she would have been like any other, any other girl. She probably wanted a guy with a, a few simple basic qualities she probably wanted a few simple things, someone, someone who was strong and handsome and charming and drove a nice donkey, um, a, a newer model that's reliable, nothing, nothing fancy, a good job, a man with a bright future, someone with, with strong hands and a soft heart, someone who's close to mom but not a mama's boy. She, she wanted a guy that was bold but yet humble, someone who was decisive and yet flexible, well-groomed but not too obsessed. She wanted someone who had big goals yet was easygoing, someone that made her feel safe but he was still a little dangerous. Someone who liked chocolate-covered strawberries, long walks on the beach, and old movies. Most of all, she wanted a guy who was godly. They're the one who would be the daddy to her children. You know what? I, I just made all that stuff up. But, but I'm sure she had dreams. I'm sure she had hopes and dreams. She, she would meet him, and, and he'd propose on, on the Bethlehem Bridge, and, and the photographer would get the perfect Instagram moment, and they'd get, they'd get married in Jerusalem Gardens. It would be perfect. You know, they'd have two kids, a boy and a girl. The boy would be Joey Jr., and, and the girl would be Ava or Olivia. They haven't really decided yet. They, 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 they'd have a dog and a cat. They'd spend four nights a week doing Netflix and chill, and, and she had hopes. She had dreams, and the angel comes to her and says, no, no, no. God has something different for you, disturbed and confused. Some of you, 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 you kind of had a plan. You had some hopes and some dreams. Maybe you were done at two kids, but you had a bonus round. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. Or the opposite. You hoped for three kids, and you found that you couldn't conceive your first. And you're disturbed and confused. You had that, that job. It, it was perfect job when you took it. You had no idea that the company was going to eventually be downsizing, and now you don't know if you're going to have a job. How are you going to pay your bills? It's weighing on you. It could be a relational issue. Your marriage isn't where you want it to be. There could be an empty table at the Christmas, or an empty chair at the Christmas table this year. The person that was there last year, for whatever reason, they're not there this year. You never thought it would happen. It could be a health issue. It could be a financial weight. It could be any number of things, and you're disturbed and confused. You didn't think this is the way that it would be. You're like Mary. And when, when you think about Mary, she didn't know what the end of the story was going to be. She didn't know three decades later that Jesus was going to be on the cross and then he would die and then God would raise him from the dead and all the angels would sing and he'd ascend up to heaven and he'd be seated at the right hand of God the Father. She didn't know that. And, and you don't know what's going to happen in your particular situation. And so Mary had a choice to make you don't always have the power to control but you do always have the power to surrender so she had to make a choice between her dreams and god's destiny she had to make a decision between her plans and what appeared to be god's purpose 
She had to choose between her control and God's calling. And what, what I love about Mary is this. Even though she didn't understand the plan, she didn't know all the details, it wasn't all laid out before her. She trusted that God had a purpose. God's doing something. You always have the power to surrender. But sometimes we, we try to pull off partial surrender. Like, I'm 87.5% surrendered. You know, like, like I trusted him to save my soul, but I'm still going to indulge my addiction. I'm not giving it up. I trust him to make my past okay, but I'm not going to trust him with my money. I, I trust him to give me peace when I'm hurting, but I don't trust him with my kids. I'm still going to control them. There, there's no such thing, though, as partial surrender. So what is our desire to control rooted in? Where, where, does, it, where does it come from? When I look at all, all the different areas of my life to control and believe me when I tell you, I'm preaching to myself today, uh, too. I mean, I've, I've got these control issues. I think my wife is at home, and I just heard her say amen. Um, so here's the thing. My desire to control is rooted in a lack of faith. My desire to control is rooted in a lack of faith. The more I find myself trying to control, the more, the more I overestimate my ability to control, the more I underestimate the goodness of God. And, and it's not going to be easy because the culture tells us, you've got to make it happen. You've got to do it. If, if it's, if it's going to be, it's up to me. And I've got to get in there. I've got to be strong. I've got to manipulate it. I've got to make it happen. But Jesus says something that's diametrically opposed to everything the culture says. Jesus says if you cling to your life, in other words, if you try to be in control, you're actually going to lose it. But, but if, you, if you give up your life, if you surrender it to me, Jesus says, you'll find it. In other words, to fully follow Jesus is to surrender control. And the interesting thing is this, is that surrendering control is not just a one-time decision. You can't just sit back and say, oh, well, you know, back in 2012, I surrendered control to Jesus, so hey, I'm all good. It, it's a daily choice. Sometimes it's a moment-by-moment it's a moment choice. And when we look at Mary's surrender, what's so interesting is every time she chose to surrender something, she, she eventually saw the evidence of the faithfulness of God. Like I said, we make that decision, and on the other side of that, we see the faithfulness of God. That's what happened with Mary. You see it again and again. Okay, you're a virgin, and you're going to be pregnant, and she's got to tell Joseph this and break the news to him. But she says, okay, let it be. She surrenders. What does God do? She doesn't know he's going to do it, but God sends the angel Gabriel to Joseph, who appears to him and says, hey, you know, this whole thing is legit, what she says. She surrenders, and she sees the faithfulness of God. People around town, you know, they're whispering, about her, oh yeah, Mary, I saw her donkey parked over at Joseph's at two in the morning, you know, you know what they're doing. And she gets shamed for this. And what happens? The Holy Spirit confirms it to her relative Elizabeth, saying, hey, this is of God. And so there's support, support and comfort there. Later on, Jesus goes missing at the age of 12. If you've ever had a kid that's missing before, you panic. Okay, and, and, but, but she surrendered him to God. And so where do they find Jesus? Oh, he's in the temple teaching the adults. Oh, yeah, we forgot. He's the son of God. He does things like this. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Come on. You think about Mary getting ready to give birth. She's nine months pregnant, riding on a donkey, can't find a holiday inn, no, no, no Motel 6 available, no, no rooms. This is not ideal. But she trusts God, and he provides for her a stall, a cave, Next to farm animals. Again, still not ideal. But the shepherds show up to worship. Oh yeah, God is with us, even in the midst of this. Herod the king gets word. Who is this baby that's supposed to be the new king? We got to kill that baby. I don't want any threats to my throne. And, and so, so the king and, and everyone's trying to kill the baby. And so they run. But Mary says, God, I trust you with this child. I trust you on the run, fleeing to Egypt. I trust you. I trust you. How do you pay the bills when you're on the run like that? I don't know, but God, I'm going to trust you. You're going to provide. Three wise men show up, bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You can pay a lot of bills with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. 
God's faithfulness. Surrender, and then God's faithfulness. Fast forward later on into Jesus' life. Jesus knows what's going to happen to him. He's the Son of God. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. But yet he's so stressed about what's going to happen. He's agonizing about it. He's agonizing about it. He's in prayer, and it's so stressful that like the, the blood vessels burst in his forehead. It's, he's sweating blood. That's how intense it is. And he cries out to his heavenly Father. He says, if there's any way you could take this cup of suffering from me, the, the, so the cup of suffering, suffering just represents all the stuff that's about to happen to him. He says, if you could take this away, I'd really appreciate it. But then he says the exact same word in the Greek that his mom said. When, when she said, let it be, he said, let it be. Let it be your will, God, not mine. And he goes to the cross, and his mother Mary looks at him on the cross. And you got to understand, at that point, they'd beaten him so badly, he was hardly even recognizable as a human being. They're spitting on him. They're cursing him. He's suffering. Jesus could have acted in that moment. He could have taken control. He could have called for legions of angels to come down and wipe everybody out. That's what I would have done. I would have said, see, you get, you see what you do? And, and, but what did Jesus do? He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he surrendered. So let me ask you a question. What is it that you are trying to control that God wants you to surrender? I'm sure there's something that's come into all of our minds as we've gone through this. It could be a relationship, it could be a marriage, it could be a child that you're aching for, it could be a bad diagnosis, it could be that financial weight that's crushing you, it could be a fear, it could be a, a hurt because of something that you've lost. It could be an addiction that you just can't seem to beat. It could be that, that guilt that you're carrying from something that you did that you just can't undo. Whatever it is, choose to give him the burden of that which you are trying to control. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. What's so special about the story of Mary is this. The angel appears to her, and what did the angel say? The angel said, the Lord is with you. He's with you. Who is Jesus? Lonnie talked about it a minute ago. The, that word Emmanuel, that God is with us. And I hope that you'll feel that today. That God is with you. I just, I just want you to know I, I love you. I love you. Some of you are probably thinking, well, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't even know me. <laughs> and that's true. But I have, a, I have a spiritual responsibility as the pastor up here. And, and because of that, I care for you more than you can imagine. I care. God cares. But here's what you have to realize. Every time I get up here to preach, I can't control you. I wish I could stand up here and just preach in a way that's so compelling and so moving and to be able to, to, to control what, how, what the response is and that you go out and do what it is that, that God laid on my heart to preach to you, that you go out and your life is different. But a lot of times we forget when someone cuts us off in the parking lot and it's just all gone at that point. It, it doesn't stick around. I wish, I wish I could be up here today and just and and in in psychology it's called the two choice dilemma that i want to be able to do what i want to do and i want to be able to control how you respond to it so so i wish i could preach and then make you live it out and make myself live it out too i wish i could talk you into it to, so that you would know that you could say you know i'm going to choose to surrender this because when you surrender here's the promise is that God can do way more through your surrender than you can do through your control. It's a promise. He can do way more. That which is on your heart is better in his hands. So I, I can't control you. I can't force it. I can't, can't make it happen. I have a hard enough time controlling myself, much less controlling anybody else. So, so I just have to surrender you each week to the Holy Spirit. Just say, God, move in their life. Plant a seed. Make a difference. Let them take 
the next step that they need to, but God, that's, that's on you. That's between you and them. I'm, I'm going to set the table. I'm going to spread out the feast. But, but it, it's, it's your job to come to the table and eat, to feast on the goodness of God. Only, only His Spirit can move you to surrender. You don't always have the power to control, but you do always have the power to surrender. And I promise you that, that God can do way more through your surrender than you could ever do through your control. And, and again, this is coming from a recovering control freak. I, I thought it was funny that, that today was the day on this message that, that the, the technology stuff was all messed up. And even John's batteries went out in his microphone at the beginning of the service. And it was like, yeah, okay, God, we're just going to go with the flow today. We're, we're going to release control and we're going to trust you to accomplish your purposes in this time. Because you know what? When we control so much, when we try to hang on, one, it makes it really uncomfortable for the, the thing or the person that we're trying to control. We're, we're not allowing them to live out their, their relationship with God, their relationship with others, because we're trying to manage it. It's also tiring for us, right? It's hard. Like I said, it's a full-time job just getting me to do what I want to do, much less worrying about anybody else. <laughs> but you know what? Sometimes sometimes we, we exercise that control over other people so we don't have to pay attention to the stuff going on in our lives. <laughs> that just came to me. Woo! That's deep. That's hard. <laughs> Woo! That's a that's a ooh, that's a uncomfortable one, isn't it? That we're so busy controlling others so that we don't have to pay attention to our own junk. Yeah. Amen. So, so what is it? What, what is it for you? That, that you just need to take that step and, and release, release the grip. Release the control. To, to take a deep breath and, and say, no, I, I'm not going to try to manage all sides of the equation anymore. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them be responsible for themselves. I'm going to be responsible for myself. I'm, I'm still going to love them, still going to care for them, still going to do my best to, to support and encourage, but there's a difference between supporting and encouraging and controlling, and you, and you know that. You know that. So just be open to what it is that, that God wants to do. Let this be a week where... And especially in this week, when it can be so so crazy, and we're trying to control our schedules, and we're trying to control kids' behavior, and we're trying to control all this other stuff that's going on, this is a really important time to hear this word. To just say, you know, God, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give them to you. I'm going to give the situation to you, and and I'm going to cast my cares upon you, because you care for me. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this time today. I thank you for the way that you love us. God, I thank you that you are so big and so strong and so good that, uh, that our surrender, you can accomplish more through that than we can through our control. No matter how much we think we have the, the talent, skills, and ability, no matter how capable we think we are, no matter how much knowledge we think we have, no matter how much we think we know the right thing, God, you are greater in all of those areas. So God, help us to breathe deep. To do our best to notice those times when we're, we may be trying to control things that we can't and shouldn't control. And to be able to turn it to you in prayer. To lift it up to you. And so God, I pray that today, even just today, we will experience your peace in a different way as we surrender and give you the control. Maybe you're here today and you've never given God that control before. That you've never taken the time to um, offer your life up to God. To, to say, hey, I want to I follow you. I want to find forgiveness for my sins. I want to find a, a fresh start 
you know that since you've had your hands on the steering wheel, you, you've been in control. You've just mostly put yourself in the ditch. And then maybe today is the day that you want to say, you know, God, I want, I want you to have control. And so we want to give you an opportunity to do that, to, be, to express that, to begin to live that out. And one of the ways that we do that around here is, is through a simple prayer. It just kind of marks this, this point in time. And you're not going to be saying it by yourself. We, we all say it because it reflects things that are going on in all of our hearts. So I invite you to repeat it after me, phrase by phrase, and pray, Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin. Please forgive me of all I've done wrong. Help me live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.